Cool, yeah, we're recording, Matt. So, um, yeah, if you want They're to awesome. introduce They're yourself awesome. and uh, yeah, go off on, on your points, man. Cheers. Yep, yep. So, uh, my name is Matt, Matt Jacob. Recently moved out to Thailand about two and a half months ago, I'd say in March. But it's something I've been planning for a while now. But a little bit of background. Used to go to uni, dropped out of the first year. And I was dabbling into a lot of different businesses as well. Um, like you can name it all. I was doing agency. I was doing like reselling clothes in the charity shop, uh, freelancing. I, I tried everything. And the one that I settled with was appointment setting. And when I was in uni, I was running this. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to grow my uh, coaching business. So I went from agency to a coaching business. I got a mentor for that. I used my uh, student finance to actually get in the mentorship. So desperate times. So went, went and tried to figure that out throughout the entire year. Didn't go to my lectures. I uh, didn't really go out to party that often. I was literally just trying to use that space, that room away from my parents to really try and grind this uh, business out. And then by the end of it, still no clients, still didn't come to fruition. I had to move back home with parents for about like nine months, I'd say. So nine months of just headbutting, disagreeing, you know, asking me like, okay, when are you going to get a job? Is this, where's this business going? A lot of uncertainty, right? It, it wasn't fun. And again, I was just, I just had that faith in myself to figure out this business. But as time went on, I realized, okay, it's not going anywhere. This coaching business isn't going anywhere. One of my friends as well, he popped up at the right time. He asked me, he just recently went viral on TikTok. This was in October time. He went viral on TikTok. He's like, hey, Matt, I'm getting a lot of inbound DMs. Could you uh, help me appoint something? I was like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. And uh, within that first week, I think I made my, my first commission from appointment setting. So, yeah, it's decided to scrap the business. Just went all in with appointment setting been building that since october november and then until march i was uh, you know financially ready and you know mentally ready to to make the, the move out to across the other side of the world and ever since then we've just been growing growing the appointment setting growing the brand the personal brand growing the connections and uh yeah that's little uh little backstory so what i had in mind that we're going to talk about is obviously appointment setting. That's going to be the bulk of today's call, as well as, you know, moving out to Thailand, doing remote work, as well as personal branding too. So I'll touch on these uh, one by one. So in terms of appointment setting, I realized a couple people in this who are going to be listening to me going to be at different stages. Maybe they're, they have no idea what appointment setting is. They've never heard of it in their life up until now. There's going to be people who have heard of it, but they don't know how to get started. They don't know how to land a position. And then there's going to be people who are already involved in the space, but just can't seem to scale their income. So we'll attack all angles. So pretty much appointment setting for the new guys. You go up to a business, you ask if you can be an appointment setter. And then what that entails is, let's say they have 20,000 followers um, and they're like a fitness coach got quite a fair few followers and they're selling a fitness program so what you do is you go up to them you ask can i be your setter and then your main responsibilities is to handle their their messages basically you handle their messages you reply to them all you try book them in for appointments and then that business owner is going to hop in that appointment try close a deal for their fitness program and then if they close the deal he gets the money and then you get the money too because you make a commission so everyone wins with appointment setting that's what i love about it and then same thing goes with sales where you can actually upgrade from from appointment setting onto actually being on the phone and speaking to to that person themselves and then the commission is going to be bigger the skill is going to be a lot more valuable because it's sales and you're actually speaking to people and then from that point on you can either stick with with sales you can stack up the commission there if you're very happy with that. Or you can use the skills that you've learned and uh, leverage it for when you start your own company. All right. And one of the points I'm going to bring up with appointment setting is that why I believe it's better to, to, to jump in with this first. I think it's better to jump in appointment setting first in sales. 
compared to starting your own business? If, big if, if you're a beginner. And by beginner, I mean someone who has no experience, no idea what the fuck they're going to do. So the reason is, when you're running your own business, and this, this happened when I was running my own business too, you had to wear different hats. You have to wear different hats. You have to do the appointment settings. You have to speak to people on the DM. Not only that, you have to post content. You have to learn how to get good at sales and close deals. You have to learn how to build your own offer, see if it even resonates with the market. You have to deliver results for people, for your clients. You have to manage finances. So it's all these different hats that you have to wear as a business owner. And sure, you can delegate it out to, to staff and whatnot. But if you're starting out, if you're under that 10K a month mark, even 20K a month mark, you shouldn't be hiring because now it's just extra people to, to worry about. So when you're starting out, focus on the skill. And I know it's cliche. You've probably heard it all the time in, in, uh, on Money Twitter, for example. But there's a good reason why they say it all the time. It's because it's true. It's better if you learn one skill first, you become a specialist, you, you, know, you stack up commission there at the same time. And then if you want to start your own thing or you want to transition to something else like sales or you start your own business, then now you have way more leverage because you've learned a skill. And skills never leave your brain, basically, because you always it's, it's internalized at this point. So with me, with appointment setting, it'd take a lot of work for everything I know about this uh, industry, this space, this skill to unravel. Like I'd have to completely stop it for multiple years to, you know, to, to forget about all the skill itself. And that's not to toot my own horn. It's just if you speak to a salesperson, they've probably been doing it for a couple of years and then, you know, it's just become a part of their identity. They're extremely good at selling, good at talking to people. And um, it's like riding a bike, like it never leaves you. So when you're starting out, you don't have much leverage. The best thing you can do is use your time, master a skill, you know, become obsessed with it, whether that's appointment setting, that's sales, that's copywriting, um, video editing, any skill. Just pick one, roll the dice. A lot of people get shiny object syndrome, but you just have to roll the dice, pick one, stick with it, not be see. And on the other side, you will, you know, you'll master the skill before you know it. And I say don't be a pussy because a lot of people give up within the first two, three weeks or even a couple months. You don't want to do that. You want to just have blind faith in yourself and really master the skill that you've set out to do. So with me, it's appointment setting. And we'll get on to that. There are different types of appointment setting that you can do for businesses. You can do cold, you can do cold calls. So that's very traditional. You just call up people, say, hey, yada, 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 try to book them in for a meeting, right? So you can do cold calls, you can do DM setting, and then you can do, uh, there's some other ways. You can do like email setting, but that's uh, that's out of my uh, my expertise. So I'll be talking about DM setting. With DM setting, there's two types. There's inbound and outbound. So when you work for that business owner, let's say you land a position, you, you know, you're working together now, he's either going to tell you, you have to do outbound or inbound or both even. So with outbound, you're going to have to go out, reach out to people yourself, you know, catch your own fish and um, go out to them. And then with inbound, and a lot of people prefer inbound because it's a lot easier, is the people, the prospects, they come to you. And that could be in the form of, you know, let's say the, let's say the fitness influencer, the guy who's selling the program, 20K followers. A fraction of that audience will have been following for a while they would have been very interested in what he's selling and they'll inquire about it. So they'll go in his DMs, they'll slide in and be like, hey man, I'm super curious about what you're selling. Can you tell me more, right? That's an inbound lead. With outbound, you have to go out to these people, actually find them and then start the conversation there. So with outbound, you're going to have to... So here's the thing with, with DM setting. With DM setting, here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to do this. You don't want to send one big paragraph explaining what your services are and spraying and praying that same template to like a hundred different people. The reason being is because a, no one's going to read that as soon as they open the message, they're going to see a big paragraph and they'll just think like, fuck off. I'm not going to read that. Second thing is because that's what everyone does. No one focuses on actually building rapport. No one actually focuses on building a connection. They just, just want to be in it 
there's no value exchange. They just they slide in. Hey, here's what I sell. Would you like to hop on a call? Of course not. So everyone does it too. That's the thing. Everyone does it. So what do you have to do to get results that no one else is doing? Stand out from the rest. And the way I stand out from the rest and the way that's been working for me for a couple of years now is the simple like four-step framework with DM setting. So we'll take, again, the fitness influencer who's selling the coaching program. We'll take that example. So guys, if you're DM setting, I want you to pay attention. This is my four-step framework. So pretty much what you do, first thing is is opening. Second thing is building rapport slash connection. Third thing is finding leverage. And then the last thing is pitching. So with the first thing, the opening, that's going to be your opening message. The key with this is you need to figure out a way to give yourself a reason to be talking to them. You figure out a reason as to why you should be talking to them in the first place. Because what most people do, they'll slide up and say, hey, glad to connect. How's everything going? With that, it's like, it's okay, that could work, but there's no reason for the other person to be talking to them. You need to give, you need to give them a good reason why, why you're talking to them. So for example, they like one of your posts. You can just say, hey, name, or hey, Mark, thanks for liking my post, really appreciate it. Uh, how's business going? Or how's fitness going? Now, the difference here is you've given them a reason why you're reaching out. You're reaching out because you want to thank them for liking your post. Easy. And they're going to be more inclined, more inclined to open it. They're going to be more inclined to entertain the conversation and probably book in a call. So you need to give a reason. So it could be liking, commenting, any, any sort of form of engagement. So if you have a Twitter account, what you can literally do now if you want free leads is just go to all the people who liked in your past post. Post, go to people who comment, go to people who recently followed. You don't have to do it in a spammy way. That's the thing. People think it's spammy, but you don't have to. You're just being genuine. It's like, hey, brother, uh, means a lot that you're following my page. You know, I've been trying to grow it. Uh, how's everything going on your end? Boom. That's, that's an example. So that's opening. You find a way to, to slide in the DMs. The second thing, and then here's a couple more examples as well. You can slide up on their story if they have one up. On Instagram, you know, reply to it, boom, that's your way in. Or if you have a commonality, let's say you're like I'm in Thailand right now, let's say they're also in Thailand and you find that out through their profile. You say, hey, bro, totally random, but I saw you were in Thailand. That's how are you finding it so far? That's your way in, right? You got to find a way, to, you got to get creative with this sometimes because everyone else is not trying to be creative. And that's how you stand out. That's how you become a 1% setter. So, First things first, is opening. Second thing is building rapport and a connection. So a lot of this will transfer into sales, but the second thing is building rapport and connection. So just, again, you start off casual, just say, hey, how's it going? Oh, business has been good. What about you? Oh, business has been really good too. Yada, yada, yada. Like, how long have you been doing it for? Just simple questions like that. Again, just try and build a connection here. It's not about building rapport for the sake of building rapport. You want to build a connection because... If you don't build a connection, then you're just going to end up back in that pile of people who, you know, they just want to, they don't entertain the conversation. They don't care about, it's just another person trying to take my money, right? But if you take that time in the beginning with setting to build a connection, they'll remember you a lot more and, you know, they'll actually probably consider you a friend or someone who, who has open ears to listen to what you have to say. So when I do DM setting, I just usually... I keep it casual. I just ask, like, where are they from? Oh, you, I've never been there before. How's it like there? Such and such. Again, you don't want to drag this out because you want to fo keep it focused to booking the meeting, but a little bit helps. So now you build a connect. Now you slid in. Now you've built a connection, built report. And the last thing, or second to last thing, is finding leverage. And all that means, all finding leverage means is, again, it comes down to reasons. You're trying to find reasons for them to hop on a call with you. And usually it's going to be the two biggest things for that is pain and pleasure. People run away from pain and people run towards pleasure. That's why people make buying decisions. They buy with emotion and, and justify with logic. So what you do here in this stage is you will, you know, ask questions, you figure out more about their business or their situation and then where they're trying to get to, their desires, such and such. And then you'll find naturally 
they'll tell you a little bit about their pain points, what they're struggling with, their challenges, how long they've been struggling with. And then also on the other side, where future, they'll talk about what their dreams are, what they want to accomplish, such and such. So with the fitness example, you speak to that lead, they say they want to lose body fat, you know, they've been overweight for almost all their life, and they've been looking for a change. And if you've done the first few steps right, they'll, it'll just come out of them. If you build a connection and you, you've just slid in very naturally, then they're not going to see you as a threat. They're not going to see you as a, a scammy marketer. So they'll open up with you and they'll share what they have to say about their situation in fitness. So they'll tell you, oh, okay, I'm trying to lose weight. Um, how long have you been struggling with that for? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, yeah, all my life, man. It's Yeah, I've been trying to figure out different ways to to lose the weight, to lose the fat, but it's it's not working. I've tried diet, such and such. So they'll be opening up to you, opening up to you, and then you're just listening the entire time. You're asking more questions. And then this is where the fourth thing comes in, the fourth step, which is pitching. Now, same thing with the sales call. You do you have a discovery phase where you you ask questions, you figure out where they are, what their situation is, what they're struggling with where they're trying to get to. So what are their goals? What's their future plans? And then what you need to do from then on is you need to pitch. And you only pitch if you think you can genuinely help them out. So in regards to sales, they tell you where they are, where they want to get to, and then you pitch your product, and then you go from there. Same thing with setting is, okay, they've told you that they want to lose weight. They've told you they've been struggling with it for X amount of years and that they've tried everything under the sun to make it happen, but it hasn't worked. Okay, brother. Yeah, honestly, I hate to be forward, but you know I've helped a couple, pe- a ton of people in the past with that, and I have no, there's no reason why I can't help you too, brother. So if you want, we can hop on a, a call sometime this week, and we can talk about that more. How does that sound? That's how you pitch, guys. You start off by saying, like, honestly, I hate to be forward, because people don't like to be pitched. Like you probably don't like to be pitched to when these money Twitter guys they come in your, your DMs and try to pitch you, right? But if you just, again, the theme here is casual and building rapport while being direct. So you come in, it told you everything, and then you just come in like, hey, honestly, hate to be forward, man. Uh, I used to struggle with this too. So if it's cool with you, would love to hop on a one-on-one sometime this week and uh, uh, help you out. Nine times out of ten, if you've done it the right way, if you made it casual yet direct and you've you genuinely care about the person's situation and helping them out, then they'll they'll say yes. Uh, they'll be up for it. And then from that point on, you send your uh, your booking link, boom, they book in the meeting. And then if they close, that's commission for you. The way you make a lot of commission is just that multiple, multiple, multiple times. It's all about volume here. So you can have one conversation. They come through, they book a meeting, but they don't show up to the call. Well, that's not good, is it? So what's the fix? You reach out to 30 people, you reach out to 40 people, you reach out to 50 people. Do as much volume as you can or as much volume as, because like, you're going to be working for a business owner when you're setting. Like They'll have certain KPIs. They'll have certain number, a certain number in, in mind as to how much outreach they want you to do per day. So depending on what their number is, you just got to hit that number every single day be consistent and always be in a state of abundance where you're always having conversations. You're always starting new ones. You're always having new, you're always having conversations. You're always booking people in. So yeah, some might, some might not show up to the meeting. Some might flake when you send them the booking link. Some might not close, right? But you're covered because you've reached, you've spoken to enough people and then some are just going to slip through the crash. So I hope, I hope that's making sense for everyone. It's uh, again, the four step framework is opening, building a report, slash a connection, uh, finding leverage, and then uh, pitching. And with leverage, you can do the same thing too with, with the future. So when you find leverage, it's usually going to be pain. Going back to the example, fat loss, um, I've been trying to lose this weight, been taking forever, yada, yada, yada. That, that's pain. But if you find out that they're, they're cool with their situation, they're pretty happy with it. You can move to to a future leverage. So what that basically means is, let's say they have a goal in mind. Let's say, I don't know, 
let's say they want to look like um, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. They want to bulk up. They want to look like him. Okay, that's that's a piece of leverage because your service can help them get there, and then that's why you pitch. So, so let's say they in the contract. Yeah, bro, I just watched Terminator recently, and I really want that physique. Yada yada yada. Again, it's an example. They're probably not going to say that. But they'll tell you what they want, and your job is with the pitch is to just make it clear that you can help them get there. With the pitch, you have to make it clear that you can fix their problem and that you can help them get to their, their goals. One or the other or both, both is the most powerful. So if you can mix in both their pain and their pleasure and you position yourself as the bridge to, to fix their pain, but then also get them towards their goals, then you're sweet. They're going to book that meeting in. There's enough reason for them to book the meeting in, basically. So, yeah, I hope that makes sense. That's a DM setting. If you have any questions, just let me know. Um, shoot, me a, uh, shoot me a DM on Telegram, and then we can figure out what's going on in your, in your DMs. So another thing I like about appointment setting is, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But, but what I'll talk about is probably one of the most important practices you need to, you need to get used to. And that is to not rely on a framework. Don't rely on a script. As soon as you're relying on a script, as, as soon as you're reading off what someone else has, has put down on a piece of paper, then you've, you've basically lost it. You need to get in the habit. In the beginning, obviously, you'll have to rely on a script. That's fine. But as you get more and more experience, you know what people are going to say, you know what works best for you. You need to lean in towards that. You need to add your own source. You need to add your own flair into it. You can't just be a year into your position and and still rely on the same script. You need to come up with your own source or get in the habit of doing that because whatever comes most naturally to you is going to perform the best. So if you're more of a direct person, then lean into that. Find a way that, find a framework, find a way, find a source that suits that direct approach of yours and then still books meetings. But if you're more of like a, you're heavy on the rapport, you're heavy on like humor and, and cracking jokes and shit, and you're very happy-go-lucky, then use that too. If that's genuinely you, then use that to your advantage and book meetings that way. Again, it's a, it sounds a lot like sales because it, a lot of the parallels transfer from appointment setting to sales. So again, if you're a more direct type, then be more direct. Be a direct person, like lean into to who you really are on the sales call. Don't try to pretend to be someone you're not. Don't try to pretend to, or don't try to, read off a script that is not you okay so get into habit of not relying on a framework not relying on a script and uh, start adding your own source in maybe you find a certain question always seems to help move the conversation forward and and books the person in for a meeting then keep using that question maybe that same question someone else uses it, it doesn't work out that's fine it's just the process of iteration it's just the process of finding what works for you personally not what a someone has put on a script okay so that's one of the biggest things you need to get used to the reason i book so many meetings is because i'm using i'm, I'm staying true to me I'm not reading off a script i'm not talking like a fucking robot or ai it's really me like how i talk in the conversation is how i talk in real life i'll even sometimes throw in slang now it's going to depend on the industry that you're working in if you have to be emotional then fair enough don't use slang but in my industry, we can get away with it. So I'll literally just use slang. I'll say like, yo, or W-I-D, like what you're doing. All these little things, man. It's it's all about just being true to you and uh, being natural. So yeah, don't rely on a script. One thing that I like about appointment setting, what I love about it too. So as I said, it's better than running your own business if you're starting from scratch. It's a good foundation. It's a good stepping stone. Another thing is... You don't have to be married to it. So I spoke to I spoke about this in one of my YouTube videos where you don't have to be doing appointment setting forever. You don't have to be doing sales forever. A lot of people get this impression of, oh, if I have to do, if I get into sales, I'm going to have to be doing 12-hour days for the next two, three years. You can if you want to. That's the thing. If you end up loving it, it's on you. You can genuinely do that. That's fine. But, but if you want to start your own thing, if you want to start your own business or start your own agency 
and you wanted to leverage that skill or even start a clothing brand, I don't know, because sales is so transferable. You can almost take it to anything. But if you want to start your own thing, that's completely fine. I say you don't have to be married to it because you can literally, if you decide you don't want to sell anymore, just tell the business owner, hey, I'm done. I appreciate all the help. And then that's it. There's no more sales again. That's it. They've let you go. And now you're free to do your own thing. Whereas with things like Amazon FBA, with things like drop shipping, and again, I've never done these things, so take it with a grain of salt, but it's just from the outside. If you built it to a certain level, you're kind of stuck with it now. It's like a, raising a baby. If you build your Amazon FBA store to, I don't know, 40K a month or, or more than that, now you've got a ton of products. Now suppliers are, are relying on you. Loads of people are relying on you. Certain things have to be paid. It's not as simple as a one, two click of a button to, to stop doing Amazon FBA, right? But if you wanted to stop appointment setting, if you wanted to stop remote sales and, and go about doing your own thing, it, it's that simple. You can just stop the day you decide to. So you don't have to be married to appointment setting. That's one of the things I love about it. So I hope that makes sense. That's going to be the source for now with appointment setting. Again, if you have any more questions, just let me know. Um, a lot of people are asking as well. So should I do appointment setting or sales? And that's going to be, that's a good question. When you're starting out, it's better to get into appointment setting. But if you have sales experience, then see if you can land a closer position. And I'll talk about close. I'll talk about positions in a minute as well. because That's pretty important. So if you have experience in the past with sales, try and get into a closer position because business owners will want someone with experience to hop on the phones and, and potentially make them thousands of dollars, right? They don't want some rookie to do it unless they're willing to train them. Whereas with appointment setting, the barrier to entry is a bit lower because anyone can ever, anyone and everyone can send 100 DMs per day. It's, it's not that hard. But knowing how to sell, knowing how to persuade, not everyone can do that. So the question being, should I get into appointment setting or sales? What you can do, and this is what I've the path I've taken. I did appointment setting first, got experience with that, got commission from that as well. And I'll start trying to get into sales. I'll start taking my first sales call, my second sales call. I'll start taking two calls a day, three calls a day. Eventually I'm I'm on five calls a day for the company. Now I'm closing deals. Now I'm running objection handling. Now I'm making commission again. And then eventually I'm, I'm full-time now. I'm on 10 calls a day, I'm closing deals like crazy. And that's the transition. So that's on you. You can do that if you want. Or you can just go straight into, into closer. But make sure when you apply for a closer position, you have some sort of experience you can uh, talk about. Because it's not as easy if you're a complete beginner, you're in your mom's basement and you have zero sales experience. You're not going to get a, a remote closing. You're not going to get a remote closing position um, very easily, just like that. So appointment setting first, for most people, then into setting, I mean, then into closing and then do your own thing. In terms of positions, how we actually find positions in the interview. So I never actually had, I never actually took an interview. The reason why people, people ask me all the time, could you make an, a video? Could you talk about how to perfect a job interview for a closure position, for a setting position? And I tell them no. And the reason being is because I don't want to talk about things that I never actually went through. The way I got my position, and this is a very valid, and it's going to lead me to my first way of finding a position, is using your own network. So you've got Dojo, for example. There's going to be people who have opportunities, can connect, who knows a friend of a friend, and can connect you to set up an interview and now you have a setter position now you have a closure position and people are so quick to go on the outreach go on instagram go on linkedin send 50 dms per day 100 dms per day hope and pray for a position but start with what you have first start with what you have aka your own network like just start asking people start asking people online start asking Start DMing people that you know already, even family and friends. You never know what opportunities are going to come your way. So prime example, the position I got 
that I'm working till this day with with so his name's Elijah and he helps people get into remote closing and setting it's a coaching program the way I started setting for him was because of a uh, of the network he reached out to me he was in my network and then that's how I got the position easy as so that's a prime example right there just use your own network use your online communities if you're on slack if you're on discord if you're on twitter it doesn't matter tap into people that you know already and you'll be surprised what opportunities come up and then the second thing is obviously the manual outreach so things like going on instagram finding business owners going on facebook finding business owners finding facebook groups going on linkedin building your profile up making connections going on twitter the list goes on and what you're doing essentially there when you're applying for a position it's like a war from up 20 fm setting because you're gonna have to get used to sending 50 dms per day in hopes of landing an interview you're gonna have to get used to speaking to people in dm and being persuasive enough to let you hop in an interview with them show them why you're the best choice out of everyone else who's trying to hit them up and uh hopefully land the position right it, that this is like a this is like a warm up to the actual appointment setting skill you reaching out to people and finding positions and realistically if you put your mind to it if you just focus on right these next one to two weeks all my focus is getting a job if you just put your focus on that and you, you hit the volume then you're going to land one easily you might land some interviews some of them might might flop you might get nervous, but then there's going to be one that slips through the cracks and you're going to end up working for them. So if that happens, congrats, you go to position. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it with the point said. First, is find position. Second thing is training yourself up, getting good at the skill itself, and then learning the framework. And then the last thing is uh, making commission as a reward of, of the work that you put in. So what have we touched on we touched on my story we touched on appointment setting i'll talk a little bit about about thailand yeah let's talk about that let's talk about thailand how it's been so far why i chose thailand um if you're an eds if you're an eds uh eds community if you're in money dojo there's a high chance that you're looking at thailand too so i'll put you on game pretty much you know there was a couple choices in my mind it was either thailand either Bali, I think it was those two. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was Thailand and Bali. Now, the trick is, if you, one of the things I tell people all the time is move out of your parents' house. You gotta move out your parents' house because it's, you need that breathing room, you need that space to, to think clearly, make good business decisions, start focusing on your health and not get the criticism back or, or snarky comments about, about you trying to progress in life because that's what I got a lot. You're butting heads a lot, you know, you're being very, yeah, just stuff like that. I won't go too much into it, but um, I had, I thought enough was enough. I'm moving out. How do I figure this out? So what you could do, guys, there's a couple options. If you want to move out, yeah, let's say you're in Europe. Let's say you're in the UK. Yeah, I could eventually get to, I could eventually make enough money to move into my own apartment. I'll go to London. I'll go to Birmingham. I'll go to some, some town and I'll, I'll, I'll have enough money to, to move out my own apartment. But what you can do as well is you can look to a country where the currency is weak, make sure you're earning in a strong currency remotely, and then you can make the move there. So places like Southeast Asia, places like certain parts of Europe too, not all of them, but certain parts are, are cheaper, and uh, South America. Those are the big three. So I chose Asia because of my Asian heritage, but I also like, um, I'll give you the reasons why I moved to Thailand. So I looked at Thailand and I think it was someone's post on Twitter that, that really opened my eyes to it. So I saw, this I saw this post on Twitter back in October and it went something like, here's what 1500 pounds can get you in Malaysia. And it showed this sick, I think it was an apartment uh, they show, it was some accommodation. They showed this sick accommodation. It was next to some rice fields. Looked straight out of a, out of a five-star hotel. And I didn't know this was possible at first. I did not know this was a real thing. I didn't know you can get luxury homes like this for 1500 a month. Right? So that's what facilitated the move. I think it was just opening my eyes and, and getting awareness out of that. 
So I started planning, okay, which country am I going to move to? So it always starts from the outside in. So it starts off with, okay, what's my goal in life? What's uh, what the country do I, do I want to move to? Which part of the world? Which part of that country or which city do I want to move to? And then you just zoom in from there. So with Thailand, some of you are, are pretty new, but you want to make the move. Give a quick rundown on what Thailand is like. Um, if you like more mountainous areas, if you like more um, more of nature, more hikes, then look towards the north. North, so places like Chiang Mai. If you are more of a fan of the city, you go to Bangkok because that's that's crazy. I've never been there, but I've seen how crazy it is. It's very very city, very busy. And then the last thing is, let's say you want you want to move near the beach. You're you love the tropical climate, you love beaches, you love the sea. Then uh, go down south. So places like Koh Samui, which I'm at, Phuket, Koh Phangan, Koh Tao. All these islands, um, yeah, all these islands near the sea, near the beach, coconuts, all that stuff. So you got to decide in the beginning. Okay, what do I want to do? What what am I aiming for? What are my preferences? Once you've decided what your preferences are, what you do next is, you know, I think the big three things that I had to consider moving out here was accommodation. Uh, what else? What else? What else? So it was accommodation, fucking accommodation, cost. Uh, I think network too. Network's pretty important because, yeah, you could go ahead and do this on your, on, by yourself, but it's pretty boring. Um, I think it was those three things. It was cost, accommodation, uh, how to, oh yeah, visa. That's it. Visa, logistics, things like that. So we'll give a quick rundown on how I sorted out all these, all these logistics, all these uh, things on the list so you can start making your move out to Thailand. So first things first with the visa. Um, it's 30-day visa on arrival, so you don't need to apply online. You can just rock up at the airport. They'll give you a stamp. It's 30-day visa on arrival. If you are planning to stay longer, you go to the nearest immigration office near you. It'll pop up on Google Maps. You go there, and then they'll give you another stamp. They'll give you another 30-day visa extension. So now you've got 60 days in Thailand. If you want to do further, if you want to stay there even longer what you do is you go on a visa run and that's that's like a it's a bit of a road mission for sure so do a visa run and then now you've extended for 90 days if you wanted to stay longer so again it depends on what your goals are define what you want to do in life you if you want to do longer then you start looking to things like student visas where you have to pay like a grand to for two or three years i'm not sure what the rules are there but um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. It's pretty easy, pretty easy to get a visa, pretty easy to get an extension. So it's it's pretty low stress. Second thing is accommodation. So it depends on how how hard you want to go here. If you want to rent a villa with your boys, three bedroom, overlooking the sea, overlooking the ocean, then that's going to be more towards the higher end. So we're looking at about two, three, four K a month. And again, you could split it. You could split this stuff with your boys. Instead of doing it on your own, find some people you want to move in with. You have the same mission. You want to work remotely and pretty much just split it between you. So now you've got a nice, a pretty sick villa overlooking the ocean and you're only paying like, let's say you're paying three K, you're only paying like a grand a month for it. And this is on the higher end too. If you decide you wanna, you don't want to go as crazy, you just want something that does the job, then you can easily find places, find villas, whether that's a villa, that's a, a condo, an apartment. You can easily find it for like 500, 600, 700 quid per month. And it's amazing value too. Like, What, what is that going to get you in the West? What's that going to get you in Europe? Right? Nothing. So that's accommodation. It's pretty easy. The what I can do is I can drop the the websites that I looked at, and I've got a connection as well, so I can drop that in as well if you're looking for a for like a realtor. But if you don't know what else to do, the, the the easy fix for accommodation is you look on Airbnb, find some properties there, and then 
Another thing is, uh, what else? What else? I'd say another thing is is costs. So things like things like transport, things like fuel, all this is really cheap. Your primary mode of transportation in Thailand, I mean, it depends if you're in Bangkok, not so, maybe not so much, but if you're going to like Koh Samui or Phuket, you're going to be riding around on a on a scooter, and that's that's pretty cheap. It's like five quid a day per month. That's like forty to forty to eighty per month. I guess what I'm trying to say here is, boys, it's just like you have a better quality of life when you move to somewhere like Thailand, when you move to somewhere like Southeast Asia. I mean, to, to South America, right? A better quality of life, and yet you're you're living on half the cost. It's all one big chess move. If you're starting out, so I'm, I'm going to be talking to the people who are starting out. If you're starting out, let's say with appointment setting, the biggest chess move you can make is going to somewhere where the life of, the quality of life is higher, but the costs are lower. That's the ideal breeding ground for for growth, right there. Instead of staying in in UK or or US and living with your parents and eventually hoping, and eventually hoping that your your little business turns out well. Just move to some. Just take the move. Just make, take the leap. Okay. Just take the leap. Move abroad. Move to Thailand. Move to fucking I don't know, Bali, Vietnam, Mexico, Colombia. I'm just rifling off places. Uh, Chile, Peru. Even places in Europe. Um, I'm not too familiar with that, but yeah, it's just it's one big chess move. And then eventually, use that quality of life. You know, you're eating good. You're you're meeting the right people. You've got headspace. You've got good headspace, and uh, you manage to scale your business. You manage to scale in sales. Your performance is better. You're getting more business ideas. You stay here for a couple months, and then now you've basically tripled your income. Now you have options. Now you can choose to go somewhere like Dubai. Now you have an option to go to London, or or LA, or Miami. Right. That's that's one big chess move, pretty much. If you're starting out. Go somewhere where it's cheaper, but the quality of life is higher. So, yeah, that's uh, that's Thailand for you. In terms of the network as well, it's super easy to to network with like-minded killers because everyone has the same idea. You know, if you're working a nine-to-five, if you're working uh, a typical, and this isn't the shit on them, but it's just if you're working a typical a typical gig, then you're probably not going to have the facilities to you know live in Thailand for several months it's usually going to be people who are running their own thing and people who run their own thing aka like entrepreneurs or you know they're just making wi-fi money they're going to be operating on a different wavelength and not only that that's going to be the people the majority of people who come here to like places like thailand places like vietnam or south america right that's going to be the majority of people you run you run to therefore it's going to be easy to network it's going to be easy to meet like-minded killers like i met i joined this community online and i met a ton of killers there and a lot of them were in thailand already so when i got to thailand it was super easy to connect with them you know they're running maybe they're running a fitness business maybe they're running a self-improvement business i don't know maybe they were doing crypto maybe they were doing whatnot right so building that circle is super important and it's it's made 10 times easier by moving moving abroad instead of staying in your hometown. The way I met Ed and Sam is, so I met Sam first and then he introduced me to Ed. And then ever since then, you know, we've, we've sorted out a couple, we made a couple moves together. Like I've helped out with money dojo. I've helped out with certain things. I'm doing this call now. There's a value exchange. And then that's how easy that value. That's how easy networking is. Provide value to one another. But you make it easy for yourself by putting yourself where like it's easy to, to network. So I hope that makes sense. Don't stay in your hometown because that's not going to happen. And uh, yeah. So what are we talked about? Ed, you want to bump in with something or you good? Rambled for quite a while. Yo, yeah. No, it's been good, man. It's been good. Um, good intro on... Uh... DM setting and whatnot. I think that's a good avenue for a lot of people to get started. Um, let me turn this. Stuff. 
Uh, I'll say yeah, one more thing. Okay. I'll say one more um, thing. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so like per- personal branding because that's a big component. Personal branding is, you know, you, you hear about it a lot on Twitter. You hear a lot, a lot about it on social media. Maybe you don't fully know how to build your personal brand, but all I can say is there's pretty much no downside to building your personal brand. There's no, pretty much no downside to posting online, posting about what you're passionate about, posting about what you're good at, or even documenting the journey. So one of the tweets that inspired this is there was this fitness influencer and she basically, I think 12 months ago, she started posting on TikTok. She didn't know what she was doing, but she wanted to do fitness. So all she did for a year was make one TikTok a day about fitness. And it didn't have to be perfect too. She just whipped up a video, put it on TikTok, and then left it be. And she did that for 365 days. And then now, let me let me pull up the tweet quickly. So I'm not mistaken. Yeah, let, let me find it. So pretty much with her, 12 months has gone by and now she's living in Dubai. I think she's, what's she worth, like 10 mil? Give me one second to pull up the, the tweet. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure, but we'll run with it. All I'm trying to say is, guys, if you start posting every single day for 365 days, you don't skip a day, you stay consistent, you don't overthink the process, it's going to take you a lot further than, than what you can expect. Yeah, okay, found it. So the tweet reads, Met a girl in Dubai making 10 million a year at 26 with 10 employees. Legit fitness business. How did she do it? She posted a valuable fitness video on IG Live every day for six months. Said her biggest boom came when she stopped caring about looking cool and just focused on value. So I'll send that in the in the group chat. But a couple things to learn from that. Focus on value. Don't worry about looking cool. Don't worry about pretending to be someone you're not. Show up consistently every day. And your time is going to come. And then... And the last thing is it's going to take you further than you can expect. Like this girl, I bet she didn't, I bet she didn't anticipate she'd be making 10 million a year with 10 employees and moving to Dubai. She just focused on posting every day and, and showing up every day, providing value to her audience. That's it. So if you guys are on Twitter, don't skip a day when you, when you tweet, make sure it's as valuable as possible. Know the type of people you're, you're trying to help and then just speak to that audience. Be as consistent as you can. The way you're going to stand out is through stories, through being controversial and being consistent. So tell more stories because no one can replicate the life experiences that you went through. Be more controversial because not everyone has the balls to do though to do so. And uh, that's going to elicit an emotional reaction and emotions is what drives engagement. And then the last thing is, is just be consistent. If people are constantly seeing your post, your face online, then... And it's only a matter of time until you know, they really like you, really, really trust you, and want to buy from you. So speaking of buying, with your personal brand, if you're posting every day, if you're putting out value every day, you can go a couple of different avenues now. Now you have options. If you want to start a, if you want to mentor people, you can go mentor. If you want to launch your own product, you can go launch your product. If you build your audience the right way, then they'll buy whatever you have to offer, pretty much. So uh, yeah. That's that. That's pretty much that. I I mean, in terms of my end, I did YouTube. Didn't think it was going to go anywhere, but I just focused on what that tweet said. Just focus on, on showing up every day, providing value. Don't be someone you're not. You know, iterate, make tweaks. And uh, yeah, here we are today. People are asking me about appointment setting. People are, uh, again, not to toot my own horn, but... It's like I get a lot of people asking me about DM setting, about helping the business and such and such and the connections I made. Uh, just being in this space has been amazing. So, yeah, 
that all started with just posting every day on YouTube. But, uh, yeah, yeah, man, your YouTube's doing really well. You're picking up good momentum, and yeah, anytime I open up YouTube, there's a video there. So yeah, <laughs> no I way, tell. it's gonna pop. That's crazy. That's it's crazy. Already yeah, it's a matter of time. And it, and like I see your Instagram stories, like they're pretty heavily engaged. Like people asking questions all the time and stuff. So it's already there, pretty much the engagement, the interest, and it's just continuing with that tweet, like you said, like just getting the content out there and it finding the right people. Yep, exactly. You don't have to be famous too. That's the thing. You don't. You can. Mm. You can have fucking two thousand followers, but then fifteen hundred of them love your stuff and and buy from you. Then you're gonna be just as affluent, just as wealthy as the guy who's got a million followers, but only two hundred people actually engage with them and actually fuck with them. So that's another misconception. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be famous on TikTok. Just make sure you're providing value. Build a cult audience. Let the people do the talking and just be consistent. So yeah, yeah. Tell your stories. Be controversial as well. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, your YouTube's on the right track with that for sure. Especially on the authentic side, like yeah, there's just good authenticity in your videos, and people will fuck with you because they'll know exactly who you are. So yeah, it's good. But uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much what I have on my end. It's just. Uh, the topics that I found most important, topics I think you guys would find most uh, value in. So, any more questions or any topics that I missed out, you can put it in the chat. But uh, yeah, I hope that was good. Yeah, that was fine, man. Perfect. Yeah, DM setting, Thailand, YouTube, personal brand, etc. Like, I think that's what a lot of guys in Dojo are trying to do. So, yeah, that was an awesome talk, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries, brother, and I appreciate the opportunity opportunity to speak on here yeah no worries at all all right mate perfect well i'll end it there and uh i'll catch you in a second all right brother peace cheers man bye yeah